Hello everyone and welcome to the Iron Bars, my true crime YouTube channel. So without further ado, let's get into today's case. So today's case is the story of the murder of the Van Breda family. I remember this case so very well. I remember how frustrating it was. I remember what it did to a lot of South Africans to a point where they resented the accused, to a point where many of us, myself included, ended up just becoming disinterested in this case because it was dragging on forever. And secondly, the accused was just insulting our intelligence and I tapped out. I was like, no, I'm done. So. The Van Breda family, Martin and Teresa Van Breda, they were born in Pretoria, South Africa. So they both grew up, from what I understand, from pretty wealthy families. So Martin started his own businesses, which were very successful here in South Africa. They were still based in Pretoria all this time. So they had three kids. The first born being Rudy van Breda, the second born being Henry van Breda, and the last born was Marley van Breda. So they had three children. So when Henry van Breda was about 11 or 12 years old, the family decided to move to Perth, Australia. So the father could establish and run the Australian side of his business. So in Australia, life was incredible. They had multi-million dollar houses, both in South Africa as well as in Australia. They took their kids to the best schools, schools almost like Ivy League type of schools in South Africa as well as in Australia. Of course, they got the money for it. And basically, they were living a very lavish lifestyle, which is absolutely a dream for a lot of us who are trying out. So before I go too far with this case, let me first break down a small little picture about the statistics of crime in South Africa so that this case can sort of make you understand why the accused ended up making accusations or pointing the finger or trying to lose the police on their track for the perpetrator. So let me quote for you a South African statistics on crime uh, paragraphs. I think it's about two paragraphs that I'm going to read on housebreaking as well as murder in South Africa. So Stats SA says that uh, housebreaking or burglary has consistently been the most common crime experienced by households in South Africa. The number of households that experienced this crime in the five years preceding the survey has increased from 2.1 million in 2015-2016 to 2.3 to 2 million in 2019-2020. This is according to the Governance Public Safety and Justice Survey. And on murder rates, this is what it says. Between April 2021 to the end of June 2021 alone, 5,760 people were killed in South Africa. Around 57 people are murdered in South Africa every single day. 57 people are murdered per day here in South Africa. Very scary. So on the 27th of January 2015, the Van Breda are attacked with an ex. Three family members were murdered on that night. However, Henry Van Breda was the only family member who was barely touched by the attacker. So Henry Van Breda was born on the 1st of November 1994 making him a Scorpio. Like I mentioned earlier, Henry Van Breda moved his family so that he could run the Australian branch of his angle and fault as a managing director from there. The Van Breda family were thriving in life. They were enjoying life to the full. So Rudy Van Breda, when he was done with high school, he decided to go study engineering at the University of Melbourne. The Van Breda were very close-knit family. They were close to each other. They loved each other 
two beds. It also turns out that the boys were quite close to each other, so much so that when Henry Van Breda was done with high school, he too decided to move to Melbourne University to study Bachelor of Arts in Physics. After the boys moved to Melbourne, their parents felt that no, they're missing their boys, they want to get closer to them. As a result, bought a multi-million rand house where the boys moved in and lived with their parents and they continued their closeness as a family. However, Martin has been thinking about moving back to South Africa because he found it a little bit difficult to run multiple companies from Australia, especially most of the companies being in South Africa. So in 2014, Martin, Teresa and Mali moved back to South Africa so that Martin can be hands-on on all all his companies from here. So when the Van Bredas returned to South Africa, they did not move back to Pretoria, but instead they decided to buy a multi-million dollar house in the safest estate in the Western Cape called the Zelza Golf Estate in Stellenbosch. Now check out these pictures of this estate and tell me if this is not a dream home that you would love to have someday because I know definitely I would love to live there because I love beautiful homes. Now the Western Cape is the ninth province of South Africa. It is where Cape Town is at, also our administrative capital of South Africa. So the Zelza Gulf Estate is known to be the safest in South Africa. They have high electrical walls, they have boom gates with security, and when you enter into the estate, it's I, if you're a visitor, you have to make an appointment to get into the estate and they will give you some sort of a secret code that you are going to give to the securities and the securities will call the house that you are going to to confirm that indeed you are expected by the family. Plus the estate has over 162 security cameras that are run 24 hours. So the estate basically it is the safest in South Africa. It's gated community as South Africa is increasingly having gated communities like the Zelza Golf Estate because of the high crime in this country. The homeowners of the Zelza Golf Estate they access the golf estate by using an access card. So after Martin, Teresa and Mali had moved back to South Africa and settled in Stellenbosch, the Zalza Golf Estate in the Western Cape, South Africa, a few months later, Henry van Breda decided to come back home to visit. As a matter of fact, when he got to South Africa, he decided that he's going to take a gap year from his studies back in Australia. So if you're not familiar with a gap year, basically a gap year is when let's say you are done with high school, but you are not in a rush to further your studies in college. So you take a year maybe to travel, maybe to get to know yourself better, or you go through a journey of self-discovery or whatever the case might be because it differs from individuals. I am one of the people that took a gap year immediately I was done with high school. The reason why was because I was going through a lot as a teenager, so I felt that I wasn't ready going to college immediately after high school because I was afraid I may not be focused once I get to university, which ended up being two years, but I have no regrets because in the two years, I got to know me and got to understand the person that I am, which I'm very grateful for that. So Henry Van Breda decided to do the same thing by taking a gap year from his studies in Australia by coming to South Africa to be with his family. So in December, the older brother, Rudy Van Breda, also followed Henry Van Breda to visit their parents. Rudy was on a summer break back in Australia and he was to move back to Australia, back to school, I suppose, around January, February of 2015. The Fan Bredas, they enjoyed outdoor activities. Of course, I would also enjoy outdoor activities living in a state like that. I mean, I'll be golfing the whole day. I will be, I don't know, those I don't know. I'll be picnicking. I'll be doing all sorts of amazing things. 
that are on that golf estate. So I'm not surprised that they would have a lot of outdoor activities. So on the 26th of January 2015, the Van Breda family had dinner and they enjoyed themselves laughing and just enjoying life and reminiscing or maybe even talking about school, how school is going and probably Rudy asking Henry about why you're taking a gap year when you already started back in Australia and probably they had some sort of a discussion I would assume and I can imagine what the discussion was when because I remember when I took a gap year which ended up being two years people in my family were not impressed at all they thought I was wasting time and um, chances of me ever going to varsity may not even happen because I will get lazy so I'm imagining or I'm assuming probably that was the discussion around the dinner table so that they get to so they get to understand as a family why Henry was deciding to take a gap year. So dinner was finished around eight and then they decided to go and sit in the living room and watch a movie. And the movie that they were watching was Star Trek. And it is said that they, they were done watching Star Trek at around 10 p.m. Now in the Dizelza golf estate, they had the parents' room, they had one room for Molly and the boys, they shared one bedroom. And it was called the boys' bedroom. So after the movie, everybody then scattered and gone to their bedrooms. The parents went to their bedroom and Mali went back to her own bedroom. And school in South Africa for Mali had just started about a week ago. So she had tons of homework. So she decided to sit in her bedroom and do her homework. And uh, Rudy himself went to the boys' room where he just went straight to bed. Henry decided to take his laptop and sit on it and do some work or maybe doing some research. Maybe I'm assuming he was thinking what he's going to do while he's here in South Africa, taking a gap year. Henry said he was tossing and turning and eventually, so around 2 or 3 a.m., he decided to go to the bathroom to go and release, to go and relieve himself. Is it relief or release? To go and release himself. He said he remembers the house was dead quiet. Henry says while he was busy releasing himself in the bathroom, he suddenly heard something sounded like somebody is trying to break in. So he sat in the bathroom and he kind of like froze, feared to go out to investigate and see who this person that is trying to break into his home. The next thing that he hears is some kind of banging coming from the boy's bedroom. And then he peeped, and then when he peeped, he saw a figure dressed in black from head to toe. All that you could see was his eyes as well as his lips. Henry then proceeded to go towards the banging in the boy's bedroom, and that's when he, and that's when he saw this figure busy attacking Rudy. So while this figure was busy bludgeoning his brother, he says that he just took a corner of the bedroom and watched frozen with fear. This man just pounding and pounding on his brother and blood was splashed everywhere in the bedroom. And this is when he started screaming for help when he came to and realized that this person is killing my brother. When he starts screaming for help, that's when his father came, came running from his bedroom to investigate what on earth is happening in his house. And just when he got to the boy's bedroom, the figure then turned on his father and began to bludgeon him with an ax on the head, on the chest, on the back absolutely everywhere on his body and there was blood splashed everywhere in the bedroom once again henry says i stood in my bedroom corner frozen with fear so with all the commotion that were happening in the house teresa woke up as well and ran to investigate what is happening and then when she got to the bedroom her too was bludgeoned with an axe by the attacker hacking her absolutely everywhere on her body and she just went flat on the ground and stopped moving. Henry van Breda was saying this man was just butchering my family. In no time, Martin and Teresa van Breda were dead. 
And when they were dead, that's when the X-Men turned to Henry. And when he turned to Henry, Henry says, I came to and I started fighting off the X-Men. So while he was busy fighting, the X-Men was trying to hack him as well on the head. Henry says, I use all sorts of maneuvers to make sure that the man does not touch me with an ax on the head or anywhere on my body. So they wrestled the ax, wrestled the ax to a point where Henry himself, he managed to get the ax. When he managed to get the ax, that's when the man took out a knife. And when the man took out a knife, that's when he started stabbing Henry Van Breda on his chest as well on his torso. One thing Henry Van Breda said that while this man was busy hacking his family, he was laughing. Henry says, I will never forget his laughter while he was busy butchering my family. So when Henry managed to get the axe on his side and the supposed figure that had invaded his house, he managed to run to the bathroom to go and hide, but the X-Men followed him and on the passageway, that's when they started once again wrestling and fighting. And the X-Men who now has a knife managed to stab Henry on the left side of his torso. So just before the intruder ran off, Henry says, I hit the intruder with an X on the shoulder. And then that's when the X-Men started running away. And as he was running away, Henry said, I then threw the X and I hit him on the back. And that was the end. He had gone through wherever he came from and he was nowhere to be seen. So Henry van Bredau, he says that as he was running after the intruder, he then realized how much blood was on the floor. He saw his mom and his dad just lying there, silent. And then as he was running further, that's when he realized that his sister too was bludgeoned but she was still moving. He says that as he tried to run down the stairs, that's when he fell and blacked out. Henry said he blacked out for a good three hours since the attack on his family. Henry van Breda says when he came to, he then remembered that there was an attack on his family. He got up and he ran and he realized that the side door of the home was wide open. He ran out to check if the intruder was still there, but there was no one there. At 4.51 a.m., Henry then decided to call his girlfriend, Danielle but the phone would just ring and she would not pick up. Interestingly, after he tried to call his girlfriend, I'm assuming from Australia, that's when he decided to Google emergency services numbers. Come on, it's understandable. He grew up in Australia, so he's not familiar with South Africa's emergency services numbers. Eventually, around 7, 12 a.m., Henry van Breda then calls the emergency service number. And uh, there is some few things that I'm not impressed with this emergency call from both sides, but especially with the dispatcher. So before I go a little further, let me describe to you customer service in South Africa. It's non-existent. South Africa has the worst customer service ever, especially when it comes to our emergency lines. There is no sense of urgency whatsoever. You call the police, you will be lucky if the police came to your door within an hour. If you call an ambulance, you would be lucky if the ambulance came to your door three hours later after the call. If you called a government department, you would be lucky if you found the right person to speak to because you'll be sent from pillar to post, from pillar to post, from post to pillars. And by the time you're about to get to the right person, you had given up. It sucks. And I think we need some sort of turnaround when it comes to this. It, it just If you come to South Africa, if you're going to find yourself in some sort of an emergency, don't expect them to be there on time, within minutes, especially if you're going to call state resources. But if you're going to call the private companies, which I think the best advice is before you leave your country to come and visit South Africa, rather collect numbers of private security 
private hospitals, private ambulances, because those are the ones that will get to you within minutes. So when Henry van Breda was on the phone with the dispatcher of emergency service, the dispatcher number one showed lack of interest. Not only lack of urgency, but lack of interest. She was just repeating questions that Henry had already answered. For example, his cell phone number. Henry had to give her his contact number three times. He had to give the address of the estate seven times. And this woman still did not understand. She would repeat, are you the patient? And he would say, man, it is my family. They were axed. And the dispatcher would ask again, what did you say? My family was attacked with an axe. And then she would ask again, are they still alive? And he would tell them, no, my parents and my brother are dead. My sister is still moving. Now, what is upsetting about this call is that it lasted 25 minutes. And what frustrated me even more which kind of like brings me to the fact that in government, some government departments, they hire people who are not qualified to do the jobs, to do the job. In most cases, it's either the employee of government is the sister or the aunt or the child or the nephew or niece of a politician. Maybe this young man or woman did not finish high school. She fell pregnant while she's still in high school and she could not proceed. And then they went to uncle who is in charge of a de government department and then just take them and place them there. And when they are there, they don't know what to do. In my suspicion, I think that was the case because this lady was untrained for this job. So much so that when Henry told her the address of the estate, she could not find it on her database, let alone on the GPS of whatever they use when they dispatch emergency to the addresses of, uh, the pe of people in distress. But she could not find that. Henry even gave the dispatcher a different address, which was closer to the estate, but she still could not locate it. Like, how? I mean, come on, if we take Google Maps right now and we type a certain address, trust me, the Google Maps will take you there, will give you an aerial view, will give you all sorts of angles that you want, but she could not find, and this is 2015, just yesterday. So it was so frustrating, like I said, the call lasted 25 minutes. Twice, Henry was put on hold. The first time he was put on hold, it was for 5 minutes and 50 seconds. The second time was 1 minute and 51 seconds. So all of that is just unacceptable when there is an emergency. If you listen to the call, you would hear Henry telling the dispatcher, please send the ambulance. But the dispatcher will say, no, what you need is the police. And then Henry will say, no, I need an ambulance first. My sister is still moving. And the dispatcher will just go off tangent of everything that Henry was trying to tell her. So eventually the police and the ambulance made it to the Fan Breda home. The first emergency serviceman that arrived there said, I have never seen a scene like this in the 39 years of my life as a paramedic. He says the entire house was just filled with blood. Blood was everywhere. He has never seen anything like it. He has never seen gushes of wounds like the ones that he saw on Teresa as well as on Martin as well as Molly who was still moving. They said that they quickly took Molly to the hospital so that she would so that they can start stabilizing her. Indeed, she was taken to the hospital with no questions asked and rushed to the hospital so that she could be stabilized. Fortunately, Molly was stabilized but critical in hospital. The paramedics say that when they moved Teresa's body, it was like a waterfall of blood just running down the staircase. 
back in hospital, Mali was said that she was hacked five times on the head and immediately the police decided to place a guard outside of her ward in hospital. Unfortunately, Martin, Teresa and Rudy were pronounced dead on the scene and Henry and Molly were the only two surviving members of the Van Bredaal. On the 5th of February 2015, a memorial service was held for Rudy, Martin and Teresa Van Bredaal. Unfortunately, Molly could not attend her parents' and brother's funeral because she was still recovering in hospital. However, Henry Van Breda was present at his family's funeral. So once the Van Breda family funeral was finished, the police then started focusing on the investigation as to what happened at the Van Breda family home around wee hours of the morning. I remember South Africans also weighing in on this entire case. I remember Twitter was ablaze. People making all sorts of speculations. Everybody was just saying, ah, just, it's, another, it's just another murder in South Africa. That's how normal house breakings and murders have become to so many South Africans that we no longer feel anything about it. I mean, I still felt something. I was upset. I remember a lot of people were scared for their lives because people are breaking into their homes and not only breaking into, into their homes, but violent crimes will be committed against them once the intruders have entered the house. Some South Africans were not buying it. They said, ah, it's the surviving family member who is responsible for the murder of their own family. They, some even said, look at the wounds that the, the surviving member has. If they're superficial, they are guilty. And uh, some even said, oh, it's life insurance policy, murder. Others were going, it was just a mess on Twitter because of this case. Many South Africans who took an interest in this case followed it from the beginning. But as the case was going on, some South Africans felt that the intelligence were being mocked and some even fell off. I remember I was one of those and you will see as we go with this case why people like myself ended up just throwing in the towel and say, I'm not going to participate where my intelligence is being insulted and that also turned into something like the resentment towards the accused even though we did not know at the time whether the accused was guilty or innocent so it took a year and a half before the police made any arrest on the triple murder of the Van Breda. The police had questioned Henry for a number of months since the murder and when uh, Mali recovered, she could not remember absolutely anything. At this point, she was suffering from amnesia. During the questioning of Henry Van Breda, he said he can still remember the intruder laughing as he was bludgeoning his family. During the investigations, they even looked into Henry's cell phone records just to make sure that he was not involved and he was not involved with other people to have his family killed. So at around the same time as the Van Breda killings, there was a group in the Western Cape known as the Balaclava Gang. And this Balaclava Gang they used to break into households and they would steal valuables. If they found anybody in the house, they would basically commit violent crimes against the members of the family, either by murdering them or injuring them or basically leaving them completely tra traumatized. And of course, the reason why they were called the Balaclava Gang is because they wore Balaclavas. If you remember Henry telling the police that the figure that had invaded, it, invaded their home was wearing Balaclava and it was covered from head to toe with black clothes. And one of the things about the Baraclava gang, they only spoke in Afrikaans, not in English. So basically, the police did look and investigate the Baraclava gang, and they discovered that there are a lot of inconsistencies with the modus operandi. 
And at this point in time, the police knew of the Baraklava gang's modus operandi or MO. When they investigated the Fan Brada home, they noticed that there was no forced entry. Secondly, nothing was stolen. All valuables like laptops and cell phones, money and bank cards were still intact in the house. And the surround home theater was still intact. Basically, nothing was taken from the Fan Brada home during the attack and after the attack. And the police concluded that if it was the Beraklava gang that had broken into the Fan Brada home, there is no way that they would not have taken anything. So the entire thing made no sense to link it to the Beraklava gang. And it do not make sense to link the entire murder of the Fan Brada to the Baraklava gang. Another thing that stopped the investigators on their track was how in the world did an intruder enter the Fan Brada home when the estate is so highly secured? Remember I told you that the estate is surrounded by high electric walls, 162 security cameras, and they also had patrollers that were patrolling in and around the estate. Um, plus you had securities at the boom gates that you could not enter before you could tell them to which house you are going to. And then they call the home to confirm that indeed they're expecting you there. And on top of that, if you live there, you had to have an access card to enter the estate. So the investigators were like, huh? So definitely it would have made it very difficult for the Baraklava gang to enter the estate, especially at that time of the morning or any time for that matter. The investigators also said that they did not find any fingerprints. They did not find any footprints. They also did not find any foreign DNA. By foreign, they're talking about DNA that did not that did not belong to the Fan Brada home. And all the DNA that they found belonged to Teresa, belonged to Martin, belonged to Rudy as well as Molly. And another thing that the investigators found was that both the axe and the knife belonged to the Fan Brada home. Meaning the intruder did not come with their own weapon when they broke into the Fan Brada house. Which to the police was quite strange because the police were asking if you are going to break this, usually people that break into other people's homes, they carry their own weapons. So usually they carry guns and they will also carry an Ogapi knife or some sort of a weapon that they are going to use on the family that they are going to find in the house they are going to break in. So it did not make sense to them that the intruder used the household items to attack the Fan Brada home. When the investigators checked a little closer, they realized that the knife belonged to a set of knives that was in the Fan Brada kitchen. That is when the police started thinking that this crime was not committed by an intruder or a burglar, but it was committed by a cold-blooded family member. And this is when the investigation started zooming in on Henry van Breda. In June of 2016, the state then decided to charge Henry van Breda for the murder of Rudy van Breda, Martin van Breda, and Teresa van Breda, and the attempted murder of Mali van Breda. That is when Henry van Breda went and got himself a lawyer who advised him to turn himself in. At this point, all evidence was pointing at Henry van Breda that indeed he might allegedly be the one that is responsible for the murder of his family. So after Henry van Breda was arrested, a neighbor came forward and said on the 26th of January 2015, they heard loud voices coming from the Fan Breda home, clearly there was an argument or a fight in the family. The police even said the dead giveaway was definitely the axe and the knife that belonged to the household. When the police arrived at the Fan Breda home the first time they were called to the home, they said that they found Henry wearing a pajama shorts as well as white socks that were covered in blood. So on the 14th of June 2016, 
18 months after the murder of Teresa Martin and uh, Rudy Van Breda, Henry Van Breda then turns himself in to the police. Henry Van Breda was then charged with three counts of murder, one count of attempted murder, and one count of, of obstruction of justice. The National Prosecuting Authority of South Africa spokesperson said that they had enough evidence that pointed to Henry Van Breda that he is responsible for the murder of his parents and his older brother. And they are going to prove it in court. So I was one of the people who said definitely the person responsible for the murder of the Van Breda family is definitely the surviving member of the family and that is Henry Van Breda. As many people believe that it was for insurance policy or like life insurance policy, you know the stuff that you see in the um, Discovery ID channel, they thought yeah it's kind of like playing itself in real life here in South Africa. Initially I thought that it was something far beyond that. Maybe it was something that was building up as far back as Australia. Australia when uh, I don't know maybe between Rudy and Henry and the parents were, they got involved and as a result they had to pay the price I also believe strongly like the state believe that Rudy was killed the moment he and his brother entered the bedroom that night after watching Star Trek it was only around the wee hours of the morning when Henry decided to call his parents and show them there's somebody that entered the house. Maybe I think he was kind of like thinking what story he's going to give his parents while the eldest son was lying dead on his bed. So that's when he decided to kill his parents and as well as his sister. So there will be no witnesses. So he thought that he was committing the perfect crime. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that when we were busy trying to make sense of this, the breaking news of the Fan Breda, I was one of the people that pointed the finger at Henry. And then I remember saying, check the wounds that he might show the police. If they're superficial, then definitely he is a responsible and bingo. When the forensics and experts looked into Henry Fan Breda's wounds, it was said that his wounds were superficial, so much so that the cut wounds could not even cut through his skin. And the stab wounds and the stab wounds that he had on his torso were not deep at all. They were just superficial. And the expert said they were self-inflicted. The National Prosecuting Authority or the MPA said that Henry Van Breda provided them with false information about everything that took place that fateful morning to his family. The MPA also established a timeline of when this entire situation had occurred in the Van Breda home. They basically looked at the time that he made a call to his girlfriend Danielle and the time he called the police at around 7 12 a.m. that morning and interestingly the police say they do not understand why Henry was googling the emergency service numbers when the emergency numbers were stuck on the family fridge door the refrigerator door so most typical South African households if you go into the kitchen you would see on the fridge door emergency numbers for the ambulance for the police or any other emergency numbers that they might stick on the fridge door. So Henry could have just simply looked at them and then called the police instead of Googling. And many people said that he was buying more time in the hope that his sister succumbs to her wounds. That way, no witnesses will be left. Oh, another thing that I forgot to mention, when Henry Van Breda was talking to the emergency dispatcher, he too had no sense of urgency. He was not begging. For example, if you walk into somebody, if you walk into your family being uh, attacked, when you call the police, you would be frantic on the line, begging them to bring the police and the ambulance and all that stuff. But Henry was calm as a cucumber. He probably was very happy that he found a dispatcher who was that incompetent. However, I must also admit that trauma, we all suffer 
from trauma in a different way uh shock i'm talking about we some of us pretend as though things are normal because we are in denial i think i've explained this in my previous video about shri and divani's uh, behavior when um annie's father found him at the cape grace hotel he was calm he behaved as if nothing had happened so i'm thinking maybe henry as well on the line with the emergency dispatcher he was still probably in denial but he would come back to his senses and that is why he said please send the ambulance my sister is still moving and he would go back being uh calm as a cucumber he was not begging or shouting or basically telling the emergency dispatcher get these people here right now my family is suffering so the dispatcher at a later stage did come out and defend herself and said that at first she thought that she was being pranked in my mind i was like even if you are getting pranked your training should tell you that do dispatch the police to go and investigate whether it's a prank or real call, that's how emergency dispatchers are trained, I'm assuming. But clearly, maybe they are not. If they do, if indeed the police get to the house and find out it was a prank, then they have the right to arrest the person that made the prank call for wasting state's resources. Because these resources could be used elsewhere where a real crime was taking place and yet they wasted their time by responding to a prank. On the 24th of April 2017, Henry Van Breda's trial began and he pleaded not guilty to all charges. Interestingly, Henry Van Breda's not guilty plea had 18 pages that were read to the judge in court. He was basically explaining why he is not guilty. And that is when the prosecutor was just simply having the time of her life. But because what was on Henry's 18 page long not guilty plea explanation was something totally different from what he initially told the police in his police statement. Basically, these two statements were inconsistent to each other. And so these were the inconsistencies that were in Henry Van Bredal's 18 page long not guilty plea explaining to the court versus his police statement in his police statement he never once mentioned the race of the attacker or intruder or murderer of his family but in his not guilty plea statement he mentions that they were black and yes you heard me correctly they not the intruder that's because in his not guilty plea explanation, Henry Van Breda tells the court that he heard more than one voices while his parents and his brother were being attacked. And you guessed it right, he even said that they spoke in Afrikaans. So now remember the Baraclava gang? So it's clear that Henry Van Breda has been reading on his family murder on the papers and that the police were also investigating the Baraclava gang. And now he decided to include that in his uh, not guilty plea explanation where he said there were more than one and they spoke in Afrikaans. And of course, their heads were covered in baraclava. All you could see was the eyes and the mouth. So Henry Van Breda was basically pointing the entire murder of his family to the baraclava gang. Another thing that he failed to mention in his not guilty plea explanation is the timeline of how all it happened. But in the police statement, he does give a timeline. Another thing that he explained in his not guilty plea was the fact that while he was waiting for the police, he decided to go and take a smoke. Now, people were like, wait a minute. You took a smoke instead of being with your family, especially your sister who was still moving. You should be by her side telling her to hold on. The emergency is coming. Hold on. Instead, you are outside taking a smoke. That did not make sense to anybody. That's cold-blooded. Any normal person would be with their family who some of them were already passed on. 
I don't know, doing whatever you would be doing, maybe crying, making sure that there's no pulse. But no, Henry took a smoke. The state then started to make its case as to why the court should find Henry van Breda guilty for the triple murder of his brother, his mom and dad and the attempted murder of his sister and also obstruction of justice. Susan Galloway was the prosecutor that was assigned to this case to prosecute Henry van Breda. And Susan Galloway is known to be a no-nonsense prosecutor in the Western Cape. The main thing that Susan had taken to the court was to prove that there was no intruder that came into the van Breda home and murdered the family. But it was Henry van Breda who was responsible for the murder of his family and the attempted murder of his sister. Understand, the prosecutor then called the family helper to the stand to confirm whether the knife and the axe belonged to the family house. And indeed, the helper confirmed that the axe and the knife belonged to the Van Breda household. The next thing that the prosecutor presented to the court was the fact that to enter the Del Zalza golf estate it is almost near impossible because it is highly secured, especially when you do not belong there. She basically showed the court the, the high electric wall. She showed them the 162 security cameras, the patrol officers both inside the estate and outside of the estate, the boom gate where you will have to enter and then encounter the securities who are going to make sure that indeed you are expected in one of the household that you are going to visit in the estate and basically how impossible an intruder would have simply walked into the estate and went into the Fan Brada home and committed the crimes that the intruder committed. And the prosecutor indeed did call the management of the estate who confirmed that it would have been impossible for an intruder to enter the Zalza Golf Estate undictated. Forensic experts were also called by the prosecutor where they said when they investigated the house they did not find any fingerprints, any footprints, and they found no foreign DNA in the in the house. Remember, Henry has said that just before the intruder ran, he had hit the intruder on the left shoulder with an axe and also threw the axe at the intruder as the intruder ran. So they expected to see lots of blood that were foreign from that of the Fan Breda. But none of it was found when they checked in the investigation. So Susan Galloway had just proved beyond a reasonable doubt that there was no intruder in the Fan Breda home and the same intruder that did not exist, did not, did not murder the Fan Breda family. So in South African criminal law justice, the prosecutor has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the accused is guilty for the crimes that are leveled against him or her and for the prosecutor to secure a conviction. So the next thing that Susan Galloway focused on was the police statement as well as his 18 page long not guilty uh, explanation where she just poked more holes into Henry's story. She basically was proving to the court that Henry Van Breda is a liar and that his 18 page long not guilty plea be discredited and must be found guilty for the murder of his family and be sentenced to three life imprisonment and 15 years for the attempted murder of his sister and one year of obstruction of justice. So the neighbor was called to the stand by the prosecutor who repeated what he has said three years ago. Around 10 p.m. and midnight, he heard voices that were raised and they seemed to be a fight in the house. Henry said it was not that, it was actually the movie Star Trek that they were, they were watching. But the neighbor said, I am not stupid. I know a difference between a movie and people fighting. I think all of us do know the difference, right? 
And the prosecutor had said, Henry, in his police statement, mentioned that the family went to bed at 10 p.m. The next thing that the prosecutor focused on was blood spatter. Remember I said that Henry Van Breda, when the police came to the house, he was wearing a pajama shorts and white socks that had blood spatters on them. So the experts, when they investigated and examined his clothing, they found that Henry's story was inconsistent with that of the shorts and the white socks blood spatters. He said that he ran to a corner of the house while the attacker was bludgeoning his brother, his father, and mom. So it's impossible considering the range of the blood spatter on his PJ shorts as well as his white socks. They are just basically not corresponding at all. The clothing show that he was in close proximity when all the blood spatters were basically landing on his socks as well as his shorts. In his police statement, he mentioned that he did see his mom also came into the bedroom where the intruder started bludgeoning her after he was done with his father. But in his not guilty plea statement, he explains that he did not know that his mom had also been hit by the X-Men. And once again, the prosecutor went back to his shorts and white socks and his mom's DNA was found on both the shorts and the socks, which is once again inconsistent with what both the police statement as well as his not guilty plea statement. And then the prosecutor looked at Henry's police statement where he said he, after getting the axe in his possession and after the intruder had stabbed him and cut him, he hit the intruder with an axe on his left shoulder and also threw the axe at the intruder as he was running. So the prosecutor was like, where was his blood? Because there should have been blood spatters in the family home but none of that was found which the experts said that it would have been impossible to ask somebody and they would not bleed the next thing that the prosecutor looked at was the fact that rudy's blood was also found in the bathroom however henry van breda in his not guilty explanation he said that he did not go to the bathroom so the state wanted to know then how did Rudy's blood ended up in the bathroom if he did not go there. So there is an inconsistency in his statements. Then the state then moved to Henry van Breda's injuries. So the expert that examined Henry's injuries stated that the injuries on Henry van Breda were self-inflicted and superficial. He had four superficial cuts on his chest four parallel superficial cuts on his left forearm and three shallow stab wounds. So basically, that's what he, did, he had done to himself just so he kind of like um, take the police off tangent from investigating him. When the investigator took to the stand, um, the prosecutor wanted to know what else that seemed odd during the investigation. And that is when the investigator said that there were some other objects in the house that were attempted to be cleaned in the shower. So the state basically made its entire case based on what Henry Van Breda had told the police in his police statement. And that is when Henry decided to say, listen, I'm not the one who wrote the statement. It was written on my behalf by the police. So they may have added their own things on the statement. After the six months long trial had started, the defense started calling witnesses to the stand. And on the 31st of October, 2017, Henry Van Breda takes the stand and he repeated his 18 page long not guilty plea and he tried to convince the court that his version of everything that took place in on the 27th of January 2015 is true. So this is when many of us as South Africans were frustrated by Henry Van Breda. He seemed to me very scripted, like he was trained 
on everything that he did understand nothing sounded genuine nothing sounded remorseful nothing sounded like hey guys I may have been involved and I'm sorry for doing what I did and explain himself why his mom, his dad and his brother were dead. So this is the point when we were watching Henry Van Breda on the stand feeling that he was basically just making fools of us. And I was not going to be a party to that. I started losing an interest in the entire case and so many other South Africans as well, they were like, I hate this guy and then they moved on with life. Yeah, like I said, understand Henry Van Breda showed no emotion. All he showed was cold-blooded, period. Like I said, when Henry Van Breda took to the stand, he accused the police for adding words on his police statement. But Susan Galloway was like, nah, 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 nah. He, she showed him the statement and asked, whose signature is that? And Henry said that was his signature. And therefore, it's a sworn statement and the prosecutor susan said to him whether the statement is written by you or by the police the moment you put a signature to the statement you acknowledge that the statement is true and you acknowledge the content of the statement and therefore it becomes an official statement from the police so the prosecutor, while Henry was on the stand, focused on the three-hour window period before he called the police. And that is when Henry said when he ran after the intruder, he fell on the staircase and then he blacked out and woke up three hours later. And then the prosecutor focused on the phone records and asked him, why would you call your girlfriend first before you called emergency? And then, the, and then the prosecutor then focused him on the emergency numbers that were on the fridge. And then it was like, yeah, I could have went straight to the fridge door and taken the emergency numbers, but I just Googled them just to make sure that the number on the fridge door is the same as the one provided by Google. Like, how stupid are we for real? The prosecutor said the reason why you did all that was to buy time so that your sister succumbs to her injuries. And Henry was like, no, that was not it. Why did you go and take a smoke? Well, I thought maybe I was not, I did not want to tamper with the crime scene, he said. So it was just a mess of the whole explanation on the stand. So at this point in time, it did not help Henry Van Breda by being on the stand defending himself because the ship had already sunk. Everything that he said in the police statement was inconsistent with what he, was, what he has said in his 18-page long not guilty plea explanation. And uh, basically, his defense had fallen apart. So on the 29th of November 2017, Henry's defense team rests his case. In February of 2018, closing arguments were presented to the court and that's when the state prayed to the court to find Henry Van Breda guilty for the murder of Martin, Rudy and Teresa Van Breda and sentence him to three life imprisonment, obstruction of justice and attempted murder of Mali Van Breda. Henry Van Breda's defense team told the court that the entire state's case is circumstantial and should not find Henry guilty of any of these charges. On the 7th of July 2018, Henry Van Breda was found guilty for the murder of Martin Van Breda, Teresa Van Breda and Rudy Van Breda and the attempted murder of Mali Van Breda and obstruction of justice. And this is the sentences that he received and let me read them. Henry Van Breda was sentenced to 15 years for attempted murder of Mali Van Breda and one year for the obstruction of justice. And like I said, he was also sentenced to three life in prison for the murder of his parents and brother. 
So at the end of the day, when Henry Feinbreda was sent to serve his three life imprisonment and all the extra sentences that he was sent to, the prosecutor, Susan Galloway, said he found Henry Feinbreda extremely arrogant. He showed no remorse. He showed no emotion. All that he demonstrated in court was arrogance. Well, guys, that is the case of the murder of the Van Breda family. Thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoyed this story, please give this video a thumbs up and also subscribe to my channel where I speak all things true crime. And I will see you next time on my new true crime video. Goodbye.